November 21st in New Jersey is like Christmas. Everyone is excited and chomping at the bit to get out into the woods. It's the start of deer hunting season. Hunters are up before the crack of dawn, getting out into the woods to try and get the first buck of the season. I'm one of those people that starts to act like a crazed psycho when it gets close. I pull out all my gear and make sure it's all set. I probably cleaned my hunting rifle three or four times. I didn't sleep the night before. I just love hunting and can't wait for it to be time to head into the woods every year. But this past year I saw something really, really strange. I don't know what it was really, but I definitely have never seen anything like it. The day I saw it, it was opening day, the first day of deer season. I usually hunt on public land, even though it's kind of crowded. I was down in the Pinelands, at a spot I'd scoped out. I already had my tree stand set up. I was out there before it was light, trying to get a buck as they appeared in the dawn light. I usually alternate between watching the woods with my naked eyes and looking in the scope. You can see more stuff with the naked eye, but you can see clearer and in more detail with the scope. When I'm not looking in the scope, I'm just looking for motion, looking for something to appear out in the trees. You end up spotting a lot of squirrels and some rabbits. I often will see a doe or a little buck wander by, which is always disappointing. Whenever I spot the deer shape emerging in the underbrush, my heart starts to hammer and I get pumped. But then you see that it's a doe and you have a rush of disappointment. Well, this past year I was out and I wasn't seeing any animal life at all. Not a single squirrel or rabbit. There weren't even really birds in the trees. It was extremely quiet, and I was straining my ears to try and listen for anything moving through the woods. Eventually, I did hear something. It was the snapping of a stick, pretty far away. I swiveled a little in my deer stand and brought up my rifle scope to look through. I scanned the woods as best I could, alternating between the scope and no scope. I strained my eyes hard to try and see something. I was about to give up when I heard another sound like another branch snapping. I looked in my scope again, trying to find it in the trees. This time I did finally spot something, but it wasn't a deer. It was hard to make out because of the trees and the dense autumn foliage. There hadn't been a strong enough cold snap to make the leaves fall yet, so there were still a lot on the branches. Through my scope I could catch glimpses of the creature. It was very tall. At first, its height made me excited because I thought that maybe it was a buck with a huge set of antlers. It didn't have antlers, but it did have horns. They were like long, curving goat horns. They were probably a little longer than a foot. The top of its head, where its horns were, was the first thing I caught a glimpse of. I didn't really see its face at all, but I could see other parts of its body when it stepped between two trees. It had two big wings instead of arms. The wings weren't feathered. Otherwise, I might have thought this was a super weird crane or something. The wings were big and black and leathery looking. Between the long goat horns and the wings, I knew for sure that this wasn't a deer, and it definitely wasn't normal. It was near the end of my scope range, probably 450 yards, so I don't think I was afraid of it seeing me. I watched it in my scope for several minutes until I couldn't follow it anymore in the underbrush. When I think back on this whole experience, I feel like it explains why I didn't see a single deer that day. In fact, I didn't see a single other animal. No squirrels, no birds, no rabbits or raccoons, nothing. The woods were dead silent, and it seemed like something evil hung in the air. I left the tree stand around noon. I was texting with a buddy afterwards about what I saw. He didn't really believe me. I ran into an older hunter back at the parking lot where I'd left my car. He was going to get set up for an evening hunt. I told him what I saw and he immediately started packing his stuff back into his truck. He said there was no point going out into those woods to hunt. He said that the lack of any animals at all was a perfect sign to go somewhere else. He said it must have moved its territory and it was best to steer clear of this land for the rest of the season. He said that it wasn't worth the risk. He seemed to act like our lives were in danger. I don't know what it was, and he wouldn't tell me, but he seemed very spooked by it. I've listened to his advice since then, and haven't gone back to that section of public land. Based on what that old hunter said, it wasn't worth risking a closer encounter.
My story is quick, but I wanted to share it with you anyway. Ever since I was a small boy, I would often go hunting with my father outside of New Orleans in the swamps. One night we were looking for game when my father found an alligator. It began to approach and my dad took a shot at it, killing it on the spot. He shot it right between the eyes. We went over to look closer when suddenly, from the bushes, this crazy man-sized lizard appeared. It was dark in color, had big orange eyes reminiscent of a cat, and reeked of decaying meat. My father instantly started shaking as he slowly started to raise his shotgun. This pterodactyl-looking thing stared at us and began to move quickly towards us. That's when we realized it was actually moving towards the dead alligator. My father aimed at it, pulling the trigger, but the shotgun jammed. Suddenly, we heard something behind us. We realized there were more of these things walking towards us from a distance. The one in front had now picked up the dead alligator and began tearing its skull open, eating it right in front of us. We stood there in shock. It reminded me of something that had torn a turtle open, eating the fresh meat. The one behind us gained distance quickly, leaping and knocking my father over. I ran as fast as I could, hoping it wouldn't chase me and leave us alone. Even though this thing had scratched me while leaping over, these things let my father go. They were preoccupied with the dead alligator. My dad came running up behind me while these things stole his kill, then disappearing into the swamp. I don't know what they were, but I sure hope nobody ever has to experience such a thing like that again. The weird thing is, this happened in the 1980s, right around the same time that a boy from Skateboard Swamp saw that strange reptilian being running after him. I have no idea if they're the same thing or not, but wanted to share my side of it with you. So there I was on a little back road in the heart of the Allegheny National Forest in northwestern Pennsylvania, an area known for its wild, thick forest and rugged terrain. It was here that I had my encounter with something unusual. My name is Doug, and at the time I was a road crew member for PennDOT, the Pennsylvania Department of Transportation. Most of my job involved clearing debris off roads, patching up potholes and the like. It's not glamorous work, but it keeps me active, and I've always liked working outdoors. But I'm not here to talk about my job. I'm here to share an incident that stuck with me, making me question what exactly roams the wilderness when we aren't looking. That day started like any other. A group of us were dispatched to clear some fallen trees and debris from a recent storm off a remote road cutting through the Allegheny National Forest. It was muggy summer day, and the humidity made our high-visibility shirts stick to our bodies uncomfortably. As we were hacking away at a particularly large fallen oak tree, I noticed a peculiar footprint in the mud near the tree's base. It was big, bigger than any footprint I had ever seen. The shape was unusual too, not quite bear-like, but not human either. It had five long toes with what looked like claw marks at the ends. There was an odd elongation to the footpad, almost primate-like, but it was the size that unnerved me. At first, I shrugged it off, thinking maybe it was a misshapen bear track distorted by the wet ground. But then, I saw the path it made through the underbrush, with the same odd prints, one after another, leading deeper into the forest. I shook off the curiosity and got back to work, but the image of the footprint lingered in my mind. It wasn't until we were wrapping up, the sun hanging low in the sky, that I had my encounter. I was gathering up some tools from the edge of the road when I heard a sound in the bushes. I turned towards the noise. What I saw wasn't anything that I was expecting. It was tall, about seven feet, standing on two legs with a slightly hunched posture. Its body was covered with fur that was dull and faded into the surroundings. It had huge arms, ending in hands with long human-like fingers. But it was the creature's face that really shook me. The face was unsettlingly human-like, with a broad, flat nose and pronounced brow ridge. But its eyes were wild and animalistic, darting everywhere. The creature didn't make any sounds, didn't move, it just stood there, staring at me, its chest heaving with each breath it took. The silence between us was so intense that I could hear the blood rushing in my ears. I yelled at it. I have no idea why by loud noises leapt out of my mouth. The thing barely reacted. 
It looked at me with barely any concern, and then it slowly turned and loped off into the forest. My voice then went numb, and nothing came out of my mouth. I stood there a bit, and by the time I found my voice, the creature was long gone. I reported the incident to my supervisor, describing what I saw in detail, but was met with skepticism. I was told it was likely a deer, distorted by the low light in my imagination. But I know what I saw, and it wasn't any deer. It wasn't even a bear, for that matter. I still work for PennDOT, but I transferred to a more urban location not long after the encounter. I just couldn't shake off the feeling of being watched every time I was out in the forest. Now I spend my off hours researching what it might have been, poring over accounts of Bigfoot sightings and other cryptozoological phenomena. It keeps me up at night, but I can't stop. I need to know what I saw. I still love the outdoors, but I find myself hesitating now before venturing into the wild. There's an uneasiness, a sense of caution that I never had before. Every rustle in the bushes, every snap of a twig sends my heart racing. I'm hoping that one day that all goes away and I can enjoy the forest the way I used to. I don't know what I encountered that day in the Allegheny National Forest, and part of me isn't sure I want to. But what I do know is that something is out there, something unknown, something that's made me question everything I thought I knew about the natural world. So there it is, my encounter, a tale not spun with extravagant words or dramatic flourish, just a simple account of an ordinary man who came face to face with the extraordinary. I just hope that sharing my experience might shed some light on what lurks in the wild. I really think it's important that people know the truth. I work in a specialized branch of government, not the kind that gets much public attention, but nonetheless important. I worked in a department dedicated to keeping track of potentially unexplained phenomena in national parks. My job was primarily desk-bound, tucked away in a corner of an office filled with white noise and the gentle hum of old computers. My work wasn't what you'd call thrilling. It involved sifting through incident reports, identifying patterns, and sometimes cross-referencing them with historical data. But over time, I started noticing a unique pattern. Incidents that couldn't be categorized easily, incidents that kept me awake late into the night, poring over maps and files, incidents involving a certain creature. One incident stands out in particular. It started off as a routine report from a park ranger at one of our major parks. They had come across signs of an unusually large animal and some possible damage to trees and rocks in a remote area of the park. A few weeks later, a box of documents surfaced in our department, unclaimed and with no sender's address. The contents were immediately intriguing. Included were reports from park rangers, wildlife trackers, and even a couple of hunters. The documents spanned over two decades, but all seemed to describe encounters with the same type of creature. The unmarked box was nothing extraordinary, just a standard shipping carton. Yet what lay inside was a labyrinth of accounts, some typed out on old typewriter paper, others hastily written in shaky handwriting. The dates varied, the oldest document dating back to the mid-1980s. What stood out was the meticulous documentation, detailed sketches, longitude and latitude coordinates, and even bits and pieces of what appeared to be fur or hair samples taped onto some pages. The box seemed to contain a lifetime's worth of observations and data on this singular, mysterious creature. As I started cross-referencing the sightings and notes, a few details began to repeat across the board. Reports described a creature standing between seven to nine feet tall, it had a body that would put even a professional bodybuilder to shame, with wide shoulders and a broad chest. There were some discrepancies in descriptions of the creature's legs, with some stating they resembled a dog's, while others argued they looked uncannily human. Its face seemed to be a grotesque amalgamation of features. The creature reportedly bore a broad snout, akin to a German shepherd, with a double row of teeth that could be spotted when it growled or snarled. One particularly vivid account likened its facial structure to a demonic-looking hyena. The creature seemed to dwell in areas that are dense and remote, places where foot traffic is rare. Sightings were spread across multiple national parks, spanning from dense woodlands in the Pacific Northwest to the arid, hilly regions of the Southwest. 
The documents suggested that it preferred the cover of the forest, but it wasn't shy of rocky terrain either. Apart from visuals, other details in the documents gave insights about its olfactory presence. People who came across the creature described an overpowering smell, a horrid combination of a wet dog, rotting meat, and something sulfuric. The smell of the creature seemed to be another common thread across the reports. People described it as something between a wet dog that had just come in from the rain and the overpowering stench of rotting meat left out in the sun for days. But the most curious description was the hint of sulfur, a smell more commonly associated with volcanic areas. One park ranger mentioned that the smell lingered long after the creature had apparently passed through the area. This unique combination of odors was like a signature, a calling card left behind at the scene, further cementing the identity of this unknown creature. As for the sounds, several accounts mentioned a deep guttural growl, almost akin to a low rumble, while others noted a bone-chilling howl that echoed through the wilderness, sounding nothing like typical wildlife calls. I know this might sound outlandish, but the consistency and sheer number of reports across different timelines and locations lead me to believe there's more to these accounts than just folklore or hallucinations. After completing a thorough investigation of the contents of the box, I felt compelled to do something more. I could no longer sit back and dismiss these as mere campfire stories or figments of overactive imaginations. The overwhelming consistency and vivid detail across the accounts suggested that this was something that required serious attention. I decided to take matters into my own hands and reached out to some trusted colleagues in my former department. Though met with initial skepticism, the evidence I shared gradually sparked interest. We formed a small team, a sort of unofficial task force, and started planning expeditions to investigate these reports further. Our first trip took us to the Pacific Northwest, where a cluster of recent sightings had been documented. Armed with maps, the detailed accounts from the box, and a sense of uneasy anticipation, we set off into the dense forest. It's been a year since that first expedition. We've had our share of unexplained phenomena, eerie sounds in the darkness, and traces of an inexplicably large creature. Though we haven't come face to face with the creature yet, we've collected enough evidence to believe we're on the right path. This journey has taken us to the edges of reason and scientific understanding. It's become more than just an investigation. It's a quest for truth, to understand what lurks in the shadows of our wild spaces. We're taking every precaution, realizing that this creature, whatever it may be, is better adapted to this environment than we are. We're not sure what lies ahead, but the pursuit of truth drives us forward. If there is something out there, we are determined to find it, to understand it, and hopefully to coexist with it. Until then, the creature from the box remains an enigma, a shadow in the wilderness that continues to captivate and terrify us. My name is Rob, and I'm writing to you from the outskirts of Whitefish, Montana. I've been living here for over a decade, enjoying the solitude of this mountainous wilderness. I spend most of my time outdoors, hunting, fishing, hiking, and observing the local fauna. A couple of days ago, I was up in the mountains looking for a fishing spot I'd been told about by a local guide. I had packed up my gear and was setting up for a quiet afternoon by a promising-looking creek. The sun was beginning to set, casting long shadows over the forest. As I was setting up my fishing line, I started to notice an odd sound. At first, I thought it was just the wind rustling through the trees, but then I noticed it had a rhythmic pattern to it. It was like a low, flapping sound. Having spent so much time in the wilderness, I recognized that this sound didn't belong. Then the temperature seemed to drop rapidly. It was an unusually cold evening for June, and there was this strange odor in the air, metallic, almost like the smell of blood. I remember feeling a chill run down my spine, something I haven't felt since my days in the military. Suddenly, about 20 feet from me, I saw something emerge from the shadows, it was about five to six feet tall with an uncannily human-like body. The most startling part, though, were these enormous wings. They were large and leathery, like those of a bat, and about the same size as its body. 
The creature was draped in black feathers that seemed to absorb the fading light, making it hard to make out any definitive features. But its eyes... They were large and reflective, a deep, unsettling red. It didn't seem to have a face, just these piercing red eyes. This encounter sent a wave of primal fear through me. It wasn't just the way it looked, it was the feeling it gave off, like I was in the presence of a predator. I was frozen in place, my heartbeat pounding in my ears as I stared back at those glowing eyes. As quickly as it appeared, the creature retracted its wings and receded back into the shadows. The sound of wings flapping echoed for a moment before disappearing completely. I found myself alone again, the only sound being my own quickened breath and the babbling creek nearby. I spent the next few minutes just standing there, trying to slow my breathing and gather my thoughts. I felt like I'd come face to face with a nightmare, a chilling encounter with something I couldn't explain. Eventually, I mustered up the courage to retrieve my scattered fishing gear. Every sound in the forest seemed magnified, my senses on high alert. It was as if I'd been plunged into a heightened state of awareness. I considered the idea of spending the night up there, as was my original plan, but the thought of encountering that creature again was too unsettling. The van was about a mile away, parked by the side of a dirt road. The journey back to the van was one of the longest I've ever made. Every rustle in the brush, every snap of a twig sent a jolt of adrenaline through my body. But I made it back, locked the doors, and drove home without looking back. In the safety of my home, I started to reflect on the encounter. I couldn't shake off the image of the creature's red eyes and the ominous feeling of dread it evoked. I spent hours researching looking for anything that could possibly explain what I saw, but found no satisfactory answers. I've decided to share my story with you in hopes that someone else might have had a similar encounter or could shed some light on what this creature could be. I haven't been back to the creek since, and I've been having trouble sleeping, haunted by the memory of that night. In spite of the fear, I find myself driven by a strange curiosity. I feel like I've encountered a piece of the unknown, something that defies our understanding of the natural world. As an experienced hiker and passionate nature enthusiast, I've spent countless hours exploring the beauty of the Great Smoky Mountains. The breathtaking vistas, tranquil valleys, and hidden trails have always drawn me in, fueling my thirst for adventure and discovery. My love for the great outdoors has led me to develop skills in wildlife photography, seeking to capture the elusive wonders that call this vast wilderness their home. On that particular morning, the crisp autumn air invigorated my senses as I embarked on another solo expedition into the heart of the Smokies. The leaves had started to transform into a vivid tapestry of reds, oranges, and yellows, adding a vibrant backdrop to the landscape. I set out with a camera slung across my chest and a heart full of anticipation. Venturing beyond the popular tourist spots, I yearned to immerse myself in the lesser-known corners of the park. It was there that the untamed secrets of nature often revealed themselves to those willing to seek them out. My goal was to capture not only the grandeur of the landscapes, but also the intimate moments of the wildlife that remained hidden from casual observers. As I trekked along a remote trail, my eyes keenly scanned the surroundings, searching for any signs of movement or life. The forest seemed alive with whispers, the rustling leaves hinting at the presence of hidden creatures. The wilderness had a way of speaking to me, enticing me to unravel its mysteries one step at a time. Gradually, my senses became attuned to the subtleties of the environment. The stillness of the forest was interrupted by signs of disturbance, a broken branch here, an upturned rock there. Curiosity ignited within me, drawing me closer to the enigma that lay ahead, despite the faint trepidation that coursed through my veins. Then, I heard it, the unmistakable sound of heavy footsteps crunching through the undergrowth. My heart leaped in my chest, and instinctively I froze, my eyes darting toward the source of the noise. Peering through the dense foliage, I caught a glimpse of a colossal figure, partially concealed within the natural tapestry of the forest. 
my gaze locked with the creature's piercing, intelligent eyes. It stood at least eight feet tall with a robust build that emanated strength and grace. Its body was covered in coarse, dark hair, intermingled with patches of moss and leaves, camouflaging it perfectly within its surroundings. The creature's face, hidden behind an impressive beard, revealed an uncanny resemblance to our ancient human ancestors. A mixture of fear and awe coursed through me as time seemed to stand still. We regarded each other with a mutual curiosity, both recognizing the rarity of this encounter. The creature emitted a low, rumbling sound, a vocalization that conveyed a blend of warning and curiosity echoing through the silent forest. With deliberate grace, the creature took a step backward, retreating into the shadowy depths of the forest. Its movements, despite its imposing size, were surprisingly nimble and agile. And just like that, the enigmatic being disappeared into the wilderness, leaving me in a state of wonder, excitement, and a hunger for understanding. Slowly emerging from the trance-like state induced by the encounter, I realized that my camera, which hung idly by my side throughout the encounter, had not captured a single image. And yet, I felt no regret. Some moments were meant to be experienced, treasured in the depths of one's memory rather than confined to a photograph. Since that unforgettable encounter, I've shared my story with fellow hikers, researchers, and enthusiasts. I've delved into the depths of ancient folklore and unexplained phenomena, seeking to unravel the secrets of the Great Smoky Mountains. Each retelling solidifies the reality of that encounter in my mind, sparking a renewed sense of wonder and reverence for the vast mysteries that remain hidden within nature's embrace. To this day, I cherish the memory of that extraordinary encounter. Was it an undiscovered creature, a relic from a forgotten time, or merely a figment of my imagination? The questions persist, weaving themselves into the fabric of my journey through the untamed beauty of the Great Smoky Mountains. I'm not certain about the whole skinwalker thing or where they live or what they look like, but I was told to post my story here in hopes of some answers. See, I live in the UK, and my friend's uncle owns quite a large bit of land. We go hunting there quite often. We hunt pheasant, rabbits, squirrels, and duck, so there's no need for any high-powered guns, and we usually just take air rifles. Obviously, rabbits are nocturnal, so most of the time we would set up camp and go off with flashlights up at the top of the land where there was less woodland and a higher chance of finding them. But tonight, I suggested we go down to the woodland area as I had seen a few rabbit dens near the creek. My friend was very against going down there and made it clear he wanted to stay up in the fields. I told him, fine, I'll just go off on my own and see what I can catch. So I go down to the creek, which by the way is a very large dip in the ground with a stream running at the bottom. I remember that as I neared the creek, I heard splashing and kicking in the stream, which I thought might have been the rabbits. But when I looked through my scope, there was too much vegetation and I needed to get closer. As I started to descend the very steep side down to the creek, I noticed a white glint in the corner of my eye. When I looked, I noticed that it was bone. I thought it was quite cool and wanted to get a closer look, but upon closer inspection I could see quite clearly that it was a fully grown female deer, or what was left of it. This was strange because as I said before, we live in the UK and we don't have a lot of predators down south where I was. So I thought of all the things it could have been. My friend's uncle? No, he doesn't have a deer hunting license. A very large fox? No. I doubt a fox could kill a deer this size. In the end, I came to the conclusion that it had fallen down the creek and broken its leg and had been left to die. I started walking back up the side of the creek when I heard some rustling on the other side. I scooped in to take a closer look. Then, whatever I was looking at sprinted away, making me jump. But this wasn't any normal sprint. This was a bipedal two-legged charge. I could see leaves rustling behind it as it ran, and it was taller than me. This thing was huge, and I was defenseless with just a mere air rifle. But the sheer force with which this thing ran was enough to make me petrified. So I hurriedly walked back from the creek to the fields to tell my friend what had happened. I asked if it was him doing it to scare me, and he swore on his life that he had been up here the whole time. 
After no luck catching rabbits, we went back to the tent to get some rest, but I could not sleep thinking about what had happened or what could have happened. Just then, my heart dropped. The loudest blood-curdling scream made me jump out of my skin. My friend woke up in a fluster asking what on earth was that. It was then silent for a few moments and then it happened again. The scream rattled on for almost 30 seconds and my friend suggested it was a fox, but we had heard foxes scream many times before. A fox can even sound like a woman screaming. This was not it. This was akin to a grown man's scream, but we're out here in the middle of nowhere. Nobody would be on a walk at this hour. Rest assured, we did not sleep that night. I don't quite know how to say this, so I'm just going to come out and say it. I saw something the other day in the swamp that just confused the utter dickens out of me. There are two reasons that I like to go to the swamps. One, because I like to row through it and enjoy nature as it is supposed to be. Two, because I am part of a neighborhood watch. I'm not sure what to call it, but I basically go out and look for animals that are in danger and try to keep some animals away from poachers if I can. On one of my trips out, I noticed something lying in the way, off the side of the river that looked like it may have been injured. It was laying on its side, partially on the bank and partially in the water. I thought it might have been killed by something or it was injured from something. I rode off to the side of it and got out of my boat. I grabbed my snare pole out of the back and used the handle end to nudge the animal to see if it might have been resting, but it didn't move. Now that I was closer, it looked like it was a young crocodile, maybe only five months old. Well, the weird thing is, down here in America we don't have crocodiles. We have alligators, so this looked very weird to me. I got my snare around where I thought its head would be and I pulled it out of the water so it could breathe. When I saw that it wasn't an alligator or a crocodile, I don't know if I can describe it quite right, but it looked like a dog. Like a crocodile dog. I know that sounds weird, but that's what it looked like. It had the ears of a dog, the eyes of a dog, and a snout that quite resembled more of a crocodilian looking thing except it had the trademark teeth of a crocodile. It was hideous looking. I also noticed that it had huge claws and it had a mixture of fern scales. What the hell, I thought. Was this some sort of science experiment gone wrong? Its body was green. But again, it looked and kind of resembled a dog, a very thick-skinned kind of animal. It was very hideous. Its mouth was hanging open too, like as if it was panting. I took the snare off it and climbed back into the boat. I grabbed a beef jerky stick out of my backpack and opened it. I stayed in the boat, but I threw it towards the thing to see if the smell of meat would wake it up. I saw its nose twitching from the smell. It moved its head sideways to eat it. Whatever it was, it was still very weak and small and frail, but I didn't know why. I grabbed my water and got back out of the boat. I slowly poured the water near it so it could drink. Normally, I think I should be terrified by whatever this thing was but it was injured and in a state that was almost near death. I checked its body for any kind of wound, and I saw that it had a gunshot on its side. It was then that this creature, whatever it was, began to act very aggressive towards me and almost coming back to life the closer I got to it. It started snapping at me and getting very lively all of a sudden. Maybe it was best that I stepped back into my boat, I thought. And so I did and this thing started to become much more aggressive and hostile in nature, almost beginning to gain its strength back in a sort of a second wind or something. That's when it started to try and stand up on two legs, even though this thing was tiny, frail, and clearly hurt or injured. It didn't like that I was trying to help it, even though I didn't care that this thing looked like a failed science experiment. It was in my inner best heart that I wanted to see this thing brought back to health, no matter how hideous it was or unnatural it was. Again, I've never seen a creature like this before. But the second it started acting aggressive and trying to attack me with as little strength as it had, that's when I realized I should get out of there. And so I did. As I'm kind of pulling away, this thing seemed to regain its strength so fast and finally pursued me by jumping back in the water, swimming towards me. Listen, I know this sounds crazy and all, and normally I would tell you you're crazy if it did. 
This thing only seemed to pursue me for a little while after I got on my boat, and then disappeared underneath the water for good. I still think about it because this wasn't that long ago, and it was very weird. I've talked to some of my friends about it and other people who are in my animal neighborhood watch group, and nobody seems to know exactly what I'm talking about or they think I'm making up the story. Anyway, believe me if you will, but this is my true sighting of something I would consider strange and unknown and possibly paranormal. The only thing I don't quite understand is why it was so frail and weak and floating under the water half on the shore like it was yanked out of somewhere and thrown on its side, left to die and then shot. Maybe it was stunned. Again, I don't really know. I'm just trying to get answers for all these questions that I have. Who really knows? Is it possible that this really was a science experiment and was pulled out here in the swamps and shot, left to die because it was a failed creation? That is something that haunts me still to this day. I've got something that's been simmering in my mind for a good while and I reckon it's time to spill the beans. My name's Earl and for a good chunk of my life I worked for the Forest Service up in the thick woods of Wisconsin. My job was mostly paperwork, sifting through reports and complaints from folks living around the forest. Now here's where things get interesting. I started noticing a peculiar trend in the reports. Folks kept mentioning sightings of this enormous creature that looked like a wolf, but get this, it walked on its hind legs like a person. The first couple of times I thought, ah, someone's had one too many beers. But the reports kept piling up, each one more detailed than the last. I decided to start a separate folder for these reports, which I half-jokingly named Big Bad Wolf Chronicles. I noticed that most sightings were around the old Miller's Creek area, a place with a history of strange tales and legends. As the weeks turned into months, my curiosity grew. I found myself staying late, poring over maps and reports, trying to find some sort of pattern. I even started talking to some of the old-timers in town. One fellow, Mr. Higgins, told me his granddad used to speak of a guardian spirit that took the form of a wolf to protect the sacred lands. I was torn between thinking there was a logical explanation and wondering if something more mystical was at play. I mean, I'm a man of science, but the sheer number of reports and the conviction in the folks' words made me question everything. One evening I was chatting with one of the rangers, a sturdy guy named Jim, who'd spent more time in the woods than in town. I casually brought up the reports, expecting him to laugh it off. But he didn't. He went quiet took a sip of his coffee and said he'd heard the howls and seen the tracks. Tracks that looked like a giant wolf, but only two feet. I asked Jim if he'd take me to Miller's Creek. I had to see this place for myself. We set out early one morning, and the deeper we got into the woods, the quieter it seemed to get. Like the forest itself was holding its breath. We reached the creek, and Jim pointed out the tracks. They were just like the report said. I looked around half expecting to see this creature, but there was nothing. We didn't see the wolf creature that day or any day. Eventually, I moved on to a different job and left the town, but I never stopped wondering about those reports. Sometimes late at night, I find myself looking through the old folder, which I kept as a reminder of the mysteries that are out there. I don't know if I believe in guardian spirits or wolf creatures, but I do believe that there are things in this world that go beyond our understanding, and maybe that's all right. Maybe some mysteries are meant to stay unsolved, to remind us that the world is bigger and wilder than the small piece we see every day. It feels good to get it out there, even if I never got the answers I was looking for. I was never one to believe in extraterrestrial life, but I didn't dismiss it either. I would spend hours on the internet, reading about UFO sightings, watching documentaries about alien encounters. It was all just a form of amusement for me. But let me tell you, once you witness something inexplicable, it's no longer a game. It's a memory that gnaws at your sanity, and no matter how much you implore people to trust you, even you can't persuade yourself that you sound anything other than delusional. I was 19 years old the first time my roommates left me alone in our apartment for an entire week. 
While to most people my age, this would have sounded like a dream come true, I was petrified and begged them to postpone their trip. You see, I lived in a high-rise in the heart of New York City, and while it was bustling and vibrant during the day, I always found myself extremely anxious at night. There were windows everywhere and no way of knowing what was lurking behind them in the darkness. Not to mention the city lights oftentimes were so bright that they made it exceptionally difficult to see anything outside at night. Of course, this did not stop things on the outside from looking into my apartment. And though I never particularly caught anything peering through my windows, the goosebumps on my skin were always prickling as though something were. And did I mention the entire wall of my living room was made up of floor-to-ceiling windows? Go figure. The only thing that kept me somewhat calm while alone at night was my cat, Whiskers. He was a particularly alert feline and would cause a commotion any time he sensed something near the apartment. This is why, that Tuesday evening, when my roommates were gone and Whiskers started acting unusually agitated, I knew something was off. I tried to reassure myself at first. Chances are the thing setting Whiskers off could have been a pigeon, a rat, or maybe even a stray cat on the fire escape. These were way more logical and preferable to whatever the hell was actually out there that night. Being as adult as I possibly could, I told Whiskers to quiet down, and even went as far as putting him in my roommate's room for a few minutes to get him to calm down. With Whiskers in the room and silence from his usual meowing, an eerie quietness fell over the apartment, and that's when I first heard it. This strange, intermittent humming sound. It didn't seem to come at regular intervals. It was random, varying in tone and duration. Almost how you hear spacecrafts hum in those old sci-fi movies. I spent the next five minutes combing through the apartment, searching for the source of the humming noise. But the more I searched, the less hope I had for finding it, and the more anxious I became. The last place I had to check off of my search was the living room, and when I heard the humming coming from beyond the window, outside of the apartment, I could hardly breathe. My terror overtook me, and I sprinted to let Whiskers out of the room. That's when I saw it. It came zooming into view, as if having followed me on the outside of the apartment, from the living room window to the balcony. The city lights illuminated it, and I cannot make up what I saw even if I wanted to. A metallic, disc-shaped object hovering in the air, moving faster than any drone should be capable of. It had a large round body with pulsating lights, but no visible propellers that I could see. Its surface was smooth and shiny, and it continued making those same eerie humming noises, but now even louder than before. I let out the most blood-curdling scream and flung open the door to my roommate's room. Whiskers sprung into action, charging the window and meowing more aggressively than he ever has before. The hair on his body was raised, his paws slammed into the glass, and if there were no barrier between the two, I'm confident Whiskers would have tried to attack that thing. I went to college in Seattle in the early 2000s. I'd gotten a fair number of scholarships, so I wasn't too worried about the cost of school itself, but the price of textbooks was a lot more than I had planned. This led me to start looking for a job. I'd never had a real job before, so it took a few interviews to secure a position. My resume was a little thin at that point. I landed a gig as a barista at a coffee shop a couple blocks from the waterfront, kind of near the ferry. It was almost in Pike Place Market, but not one of the cool spots that got a lot of traffic. The shop was on the bottom level of a building that housed a number of businesses. There was a print shop on the other corner on our same street level, and on the floors above were offices and a couple apartments at the very top level. I think the offices were for some sports company and a boating company that operated nearby but had overgrown their building right on the water. That's what I gathered, at least, after working there for a few months. It was January. I'd come back early from winter break to pick up a couple shifts, and honestly to escape extended family that had invaded my parents' house. I guess the timing doesn't really matter that much except to tell you that it was winter. It was me and one other barista closing up the shop after an incredibly boring day. I think we had maybe 10 or 15 customers across my six-hour shift. Anna Marie, the other barista, was counting the till. 
She was shift manager and so handled the money at the end of the day and had to walk it down the block to do the night deposit. I wiped down the half dozen tables and stacked the chairs, mopped like usual, restocked the beans, made each of us a final coffee for the road, split and bagged up the scones that were left over for Anna Marie and I to take home, really the best perk of the closing shift. I bagged up the trash cans, which was easy since we'd had so few customers. Took those out back to the alley, propping open the door with a spare crate. It looked like it had snowed a little, which wasn't surprising. There were warnings of an upcoming snowstorm. I think it ended up dumping two or three feet that night. On my way back from the trash, I circled down into the basement where the overstock refrigerator was along with cups and lids and stuff. I pulled three milks from the fridge and reached for a fourth. I'd perfected a carrying method, but it was precarious. As I managed to grab the final gallon with one finger, I heard this weird sound from deeper in the basement. We never went on that side of the basement. In fact, there was an unfinished wall that blocked off a good two-thirds of it all. We'd been told not to go over there because flood damage had exposed old pipes and they didn't want us to get tetanus or something. It sounded like trickling water. And when I play it back in my mind even now, there is this faint laughter somewhere in the mix. It wasn't even creepy. It sounded like a normal laugh. But there shouldn't have been someone in the basement laughing. That was the creepy part. I stood there for who knows how long, probably only a few seconds before turning to go back upstairs. The sound had stopped, and I thought I tried to convince myself that maybe I'd imagined it. I was halfway up the stairs, my attention focused on trying to balance the four gallons of milk. I was out of practice since I hadn't had a shift for a couple weeks. I lost hold of a container and it fell, bouncing on the steps as it broke open and gushed milk down the entire stairwell. I heard someone say, ow, as the milk hit the ground at the bottom of the stairs behind me. I kid you not, that was enough for me. I didn't want to meet whoever was chilling in the basement having a laugh. It was downtown Seattle, so there was always the possibility of random people around. I ran the rest of the way up the stairs and slammed the door behind me, double locking it. I had never understood why there was a lock on that door to begin with, but thinking back, Maybe there was a reason? Tossed the milks in the fridge under the counter. I saw that Anna Marie had already left with the night deposit, so I clocked out and grabbed my jacket and stuff and headed out the back door to the alley. Walked up to that bus stop on 2nd and Lenora and went home. I didn't have another shift for a couple of days, so I started to forget what had happened in the basement. But a few days later, I had a last-minute opening shift filling in for another barista who was stuck at the airport in Detroit after their winter break. I got off the bus and made my way carefully down the hill. The snow had stuck around. The shop had actually been closed since my last shift because of that big snowstorm. As I rounded the corner to the front of the shop, I remembered I hadn't cleaned up the milk spill and how awful that was going to be after it had been sitting there for half a week. We were on a side street, so the snowplow hadn't come by yet. I stepped wrong and tripped face first into a pile of snow. Dug through with my foot to see what I'd tripped over. Turned out to be the zippered bag from the night deposit. It was locked and still had money in it, but not very much. There hadn't been that many customers. Got to the front and saw there was glass everywhere on the street mixed in with the snow. The windows were totally shattered and the door was kind of smashed up. I was more than nervous at that point and yelled into the shop to see if anyone was inside. Didn't get a response. I crept inside. The door was only attached with one hinge, so I had to pick it up and set it aside. The snow had blown in and frozen to the tiled floor. Coffee beans were everywhere and the machines were ripped apart. The tables and chairs were thrown around. I looked back through the smashed windows and could see a couple chairs on the other side of the street half buried in the snow. The basement door, I swear to God I had locked it, was standing open. The doorknob was twisted off and the bolt splintered out. I clicked on the light and all the way down the stairwell there were streaks of this weird sparkly slime on the walls and steps, which mixed into the frozen puddle of milk at the bottom. I don't know why, but I touched the slime. It stuck to my hand and there was a gritty texture. It reminded me of when my dad had forced me to gut a fish and the scales had gotten everywhere. It had the same consistency, 
I went further downstairs. The unfinished wall had been pushed over and there was a giant hole in the wall with pipes bent in every direction. I ran back upstairs and called Anna Marie to see if she was okay. She answered her phone and told me that when she went to deposit the cash, someone had hit her from behind, and she woke up face first in the snow about 30 minutes later. She said she was so disoriented that her boyfriend came and picked her up. She didn't notice any of the windows being broken at that point. I hung up with her and called my boss who had been in Punta Cana for the last week and told him what was going on. Fast forward a few weeks, the police investigated, and it looked like the perpetrator came in through that wall, but what in the hell would have the strength to break down a concrete wall? The shop is back open now, after the owner filed an insurance claim, but I quit a week after that incident, especially after what happened to Anna Marie. My name's Aaron. I used to be an electrician in San Francisco until I retired early due to a stroke of luck in the stock market. That was in 2015. With plenty of free time on my hands and very few financial worries, I began to explore the natural beauty of California, a thing I had always wished to do but never had the time for. I began hiking in earnest all over the state, but Yosemite National Park, with its majestic cliffs, waterfalls, and lush forests, always held a special place in my heart. In April 2017, I decided to take on the grueling Yosemite Falls Trail, an eight-mile trek with an altitude change of nearly 3,000 feet. It was challenging, but I had prepared for it. Packed supplies, a map, sturdy boots, and a sense of adventure. After reaching the top of the trail, I decided to stay overnight at the designated campsite near Yosemite Point. As an experienced hiker, I knew that nighttime in the wilderness could be treacherous, but I also appreciated the serenity it offered. That night, I was alone knowing that at this point of the day, the next set of hikers wouldn't show up until the following day. I spent the evening by a small fire, eating my rationed meal and enjoying the tranquility. As I was getting ready to turn in for the night, a rustling in the underbrush nearby caught my attention. At first, the sound was faint and so I thought it was just a small mammal of some sort. But then, it emerged. It was about the size of a bear, maybe slightly larger, but it didn't move like any bear I had ever seen. Its legs were unusually long and thin for its size, ending in what appeared to be cloven hooves. Its body was covered in a dark fur that was knotted and filled with dirt. But what stood out most were its eyes. They were a striking amber, glowing in the dark, filled with an intelligence and curiosity that confused me beyond belief. I was rooted to the spot, my heart pounding. It stood on the edge of the clearing, just observing me. It didn't seem hostile, but its sheer size and unfamiliar appearance were intimidating. I held my breath, not daring to move, as it started to circle my campsite, its gaze never leaving me. After some unknown period of time, it slowly backed away into the forest, disappearing as silently as it had arrived. I let out the breath I had been holding and quickly extinguished my fire, retreating into my tent. After that encounter, I couldn't sleep. My mind was racing. I had always been a rational man, someone who believed in science and facts, but what I had seen did not fit into any existing categories. It was an unknown something I wasn't prepared to handle. At dawn, I packed up and practically ran down the trail, driven by a primal urge to put as much distance between me and the creature as possible. Once I got back to my car, the realization of what happened fully sank in. I was shaken, my entire body trembling, a cold sweat breaking out. I went home and did extensive research, trying to find any animal that fit what I had seen, I checked local legends, reports of unknown creatures, everything, but found nothing that matched. For weeks I couldn't go back to the woods. The place that had given me peace was now tainted by fear and uncertainty. However, as time went on, I realized that as terrifying as the encounter was, the creature had not harmed me. It had observed me, yes, but it had not shown aggression. In some strange way, I felt like it was just as curious about me as I was about it. This realization led me to a sort of acceptance. I started hiking again, but I was more cautious, more respectful of the wilderness and its unknowns. 
I haven't seen the creature again, but I'm okay with that. It has made me aware that there are still things out there we don't understand, and maybe that's how it should be. I still go to Yosemite. I still love the wilderness, but I respect it more now, aware that I am merely a visitor in a world full of secrets. The fear has lessened, but the awe remains, a constant reminder of the night I came face to face with the unknown. I've been punching the clock behind the wheel for nearly 20 years. I've come across everything from deer to bobcats on those long stretches of highway, but it was a warm night back on August 11th, 2019, near Winnemucca, Nevada, that I had a run-in that still has me checking my mirrors more often than I'd like to admit. I was in the saddle, eastbound and down with a load of appliances out of Sacramento. It was past the witching hour. The moon was riding high and I was about to scout for a flattened level to catch a few winks when something off the beaten path caught my eye. Nevada's nothing but tumbleweeds and Joshua trees as far as the eye can see, so you'd be forgiven for thinking I'd lost a few of my marbles when I tell you there was a figure out there standing as tall as a roadside billboard. Its body was bulky, like a bulldozer, only covered in this strange, leathery hide that had a weird grayish tint. It moved with an uncanny fluidity, like a dancer in slow motion, and despite its bulk, it didn't seem to be bothered by its size. The thing's arms were crazy long and seemed to sway back and forth as it moved. The hands at the ends were almost brushing the scrubland beneath. I rubbed my eyes thinking maybe I was road-weary seeing things, but when I looked back, it was still there and closer now. It was then that it turned, and I saw its face. The head was oddly small compared to the torso, perched on a thick neck. But what got me were its eyes, two glowing orbs, shiny as polished chrome, glaring back at me like high beams. I was about ready to stomp the pedal, get the hell out of Dodge, when it let out a sound. Wasn't a roar exactly, more like a low, resonating growl that shook my Freightliner like it was made of tin foil. Nearly knocked me clear out of my seat. Then quicker than you could say, what the hell was that? It was gone. It loped off into the desert with an agility that did not match its size, leaving me gripping the wheel like a vice. After that night, I was pretty tight-lipped about the whole ordeal. Truckers might be known for telling tall tales, but this was one yarn I wasn't keen on spinning. You don't want to be known as the driver who's a few gears short of a full box, after all. But that encounter, it messed with my wiring. These days, I go out of my way to avoid Nevada at that time of night. I'll take the long way around, pay the extra for diesel just to avoid that stretch of highway. And on the nights when I can't dodge it, I drive with one eye on the road, the other in the rear view. There's always a chill running down my back as I pass that spot, like someone walking over my grave. To this day, I'm still in the dark about what it was. I've googled everything I can think of and looked up every animal that walks this earth, and I still can't find anything that matches up. All I know is it's out there, somewhere in that godforsaken desert, and it's a memory etched into my brain as clear as the Nevada sky. I'm writing this to you so you can be forewarned if you're ever driving that stretch. I would suggest you do as I do and keep one eye forward and one eye back. I was never a believer of the paranormal until I had a bizarre encounter that changed my life forever. I live in West Virginia and was always a hard skeptic due to my strict Catholic upbringing. That changed one night when me and my family were out camping in the woods. It was around 10 p.m. and pitch black outside. We were all sitting around the campfire enjoying some steaks that my dad had just cooked. Suddenly my cousin Jimmy said, did you hear that? We all paused and listened intensely, but we couldn't hear anything. Jimmy insisted that he heard something, so my dad suggested that we go look for whatever it was. We all grabbed our flashlights and walked into the woods. The further we walked, the more uneasy I felt. I had a strong feeling that something was watching us, but I refused to believe that it was anything other than my imagination and Jimmy's paranoia. The woods were eerily quiet. You could hear all three of our feet crunching the leaves beneath us. No insect sounds, no animal noises, just a profound silence. We had been walking for about 10 minutes 
when suddenly we heard a loud screeching noise coming from above us. The sound of the screech was absolutely bone-chilling. It sounded like a mixture of nails on a chalkboard and the roar of a lion. It sent shivers down my spine and made my hair stand up all over my body. We all looked up and saw a large creature flying directly over us. The beast was huge. I'm talking easily five or six feet tall. It had big, reflective red eyes that almost looked like they were on fire. Its wingspan was unbelievably massive. The only thing I can compare it to are the wings of a giant bat, leathery and veiny, making a thunderous clap as they flapped. It had thick black feathers covering its entire body. I was absolutely petrified and could not believe what I was seeing. My family members were just as scared as I was, and we all ran away screaming in horror. The woods were thick and dark, except for the small circle of light my flashlight emitted. Every rustle of leaves or snap of a branch made me jump and sent my heart racing faster. I could hear Dad's breathing and Jimmy's footsteps ahead of me, but I felt completely alone in the darkness. I was crying, praying, and desperately running to survive. I tripped over a branch and collapsed to the ground, twisting my ankle in the process. I heard Dad and Jimmy's screams ahead of me, Help! Run! Faster! Go! I broke my flashlight and felt my way towards my family's screams. I tried yelling for help, but they were too far ahead of me and screaming too loud to hear me. Finally, my dad started calling for me, and I started to yell loudly enough for him to come look for me. As I saw his flashlight peeking through the trees, I heard the flaps of the beast's wings behind me. I knew it was time to move. I ran toward dad's flashlight, clenching my jaw as hard as I could to overcome the pain of my twisted ankle. I finally reached my dad, and he started screaming, Go! 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 Suddenly I heard a loud screeching noise, and something large crashed through the trees towards us. Dad grabbed my hand and we ran even faster, but I could feel the thing gaining on us. The pain from my ankle was intense, but my desire to escape from the creature was far more powerful. The trees were thinning ahead, and I could see the campsite just beyond. We were almost there when Dad suddenly pulled me back and we hid behind a tree as the creature flew overhead. It had huge wings that spanned at least ten feet, and it was screeching so loudly that I thought my ears would bleed. We were all shaking and crying from terror and relief when we finally got back to the campsite. That night is burned into my memory, and I'll never forget how scared I was. We immediately packed up and drove home. There was no way we were staying in those woods any longer. My family and I spent the entire night trying to discount what we saw, but all of us saw the same thing. We were terrified and I still don't know what to make of it. Was it an alien? A demon? It was later we heard descriptions of the Mothman, the red eyes, the bat wings and body, the anthropomorphic limbs. Could it have been the Mothman that we so desperately ran away from? I was no longer a skeptic, but a believer in the paranormal. I had experienced the Mothman firsthand, and there was no denying that he existed. I researched the Mothman legend online, and I discovered that many people had seen him in West Virginia. He seemed to be drawn to that area for some unknown reason. I later learned that the Mothman is often associated with death and disaster. In 1966, there was a bridge collapse in West Virginia that killed 46 people. Some people believe that the Mothman was responsible for the bridge collapse and that he was a warning of impending doom. I don't know if that's true or not, but I do know that the Mothman is a creature to be feared. Since my encounter with the Mothman, I've had nightmares about him flying over me. His glowing eyes burned into my brain. He's become a permanent part of my life, and I'm always on the lookout for him when I'm out camping or driving through West Virginia. I never want to see him again, but part of me is also drawn to him like a moth to a flame. He's a mystery that I'll never be able to solve, but he's left his mark on me forever. I hope this message finds you well. I've been sitting on a story for quite some time, one that seems more like a plot of a 70s science fiction movie than a part of my life. But as strange as it sounds, it's true. I worked as a flight systems engineer at NASA from the late 60s into the 80s. Those days, my job was all about crunching numbers for trajectory analysis, fine-tuning life support systems, and making sure our orbiter subsystems were in top-notch shape. 
But there's a bit of my time at NASA that's not just crunching numbers and ticking boxes. It's about something that, even as I type this, I still find hard to believe happened. During the late 70s, we came across four beings, entities, if you will, that weren't from our neck of the cosmic woods. They were extraterrestrial, and no, I'm not kidding. The weirdest part? We didn't just observe them, we interviewed them. As unlikely as it sounds, it's the God's honest truth. Please know I'm not trying to spin some grand tale or draw you into a web of fiction. This isn't some 70s sci-fi novel. It's my life. It happened. It's a piece of history, albeit one that's been kept under wraps for obvious reasons. But I believe it's time to share this story with you in all its uncanny detail. So let me dive into the thick of it. One evening in late 79, we just finished monitoring a Skylab re-entry simulation when we received an odd blip on our radar, something that wasn't fitting the usual space debris and satellite signatures. The object was moving in an uncharacteristic pattern, completely defying our understanding of orbital mechanics. It wasn't long before we realized that this was no ordinary space anomaly. With each passing moment, it became increasingly clear that we were dealing with an unidentified flying object. This was uncharted territory, even for us seasoned veterans of the space race. After a high-stakes scramble, the object, or rather the craft, was intercepted and secured in one of our remote facilities. It was a vessel of sorts, a sleek and oddly luminous entity that bore no resemblance to any spacefaring vehicle we'd ever seen or engineered. It was both unnerving and awe-inspiring, a conundrum that challenged our comprehension of technology and physics. But the true shock came when we found out the craft was not empty. Inside were four entities, distinct and yet similar, clearly intelligent, and obviously not of this Earth. Their forms were humanoid but with distinct differences, their languages indecipherable, yet with a sense of purpose that transcended the barriers of speech. In a bid to understand these beings and their intentions, we initiated a series of interviews under utmost secrecy. As outlandish as it sounds, I was one of the key team members involved in this unprecedented endeavor. The conversations, if one can call them that, were a mix of non-verbal cues, gestures, and a slew of improvised methods that we hoped would bridge the communication gap. Each entity seemed different in demeanor. One was inquisitive constantly inspecting its surroundings, while another seemed indifferent, almost stoic. The third was what I can only describe as nervous, while the fourth... Well, the fourth had a certain air of authority, an intangible feeling that it was in some way superior or more knowledgeable. Those interviews pushed the boundaries of our understanding and confronted us with a reality we'd only speculated about in theoretical discussions. Extraterrestrial life was no longer a mere concept. It was real. It was tangible. And it was right in front of us. That's about as far as I can go. But know this. There's more to this story. So much more. Perhaps in time I'll find the words and the courage to share more. For now, I hope this gives you some insight into the extraordinary reality that unfolded during my time at NASA. So, here's the deal. I'm not the kind of guy who believes in the boogeyman or anything, but something happened a few years back that I can't shake. I used to work nights in a warehouse in a not-so-great part of Akron, Ohio. The warehouse was this massive old building, and right behind it was a block of equally ancient apartments. The whole area had a vibe, like it had seen better days, you know? One night I'm on my lunch break. And it's a real nice night, so I head out back to catch some fresh air. I'm just scrolling through my phone when I hear this weird scuffling sound. I look up and there's this shadowy figure moving around behind the apartment building. Now, I've seen raccoons and stuff back there before, but this was different. It was bigger and moved weird, like jerky and kind of hunched over. My first thought was, maybe it's some druggie, so I yell out, Hey, you alright? This thing stops dead in its tracks, and I swear my heart almost stopped, too. It turns around and it isn't human. It's like this tall, lanky thing covered in what looks like fur or rags, I couldn't tell. But its eyes, man, they were this glowing yellow, and it had these long, bony fingers. When it turned to face me, I got a better look at it. This thing was tall. I'm talking like seven feet. But it was really skinny, like it hadn't eaten in weeks. 
Its skin looked kind of grayish, and it was covered in patches of this mangy, dark fur. But the face, man, that's what got me. It had this long snout, kind of like a dog, but the mouth was all wrong. It was too wide, and it had these jagged, sharp teeth sticking out. And the smell that came from it was like rotten meat and wet dog. It was so strong, I could taste it. The eyes were the worst part. They were this glowing yellow, but not like a regular animal in the headlights. They were almost like they were lit up from inside. And they were intelligent. I know that sounds crazy, but it was like it was sizing me up, thinking things through. The hands, or I guess you could call them claws, were long and bony with these wicked-looking talons at the end. It held them out in front of it, kind of like how a praying mantis does. When it screeched, I saw that its throat had these weird ridges, and it moved like there was something wriggling under the skin. The sound was so loud and piercing that I felt it vibrating through my whole body. I'm frozen, and we're just staring at each other. Then this thing lets out this god-awful screech. I'm talking like a banshee whale mixed with nails on a chalkboard. I don't know how my legs moved, but next thing I know I'm back inside the warehouse, slamming the door behind me. I tell my buddy Mike, who's working with me, and he's like, you saw it too. Turns out, he'd seen the same thing a few weeks back, but didn't say anything, because he thought people would think he was losing it. We didn't go back outside for the rest of the night, and you can bet I requested a shift change the next day. I still think about that night a lot. I wonder what it was and where it came from. I've looked into local legends and cryptids, but I haven't found anything that really matches what I saw. After I bolted back inside the warehouse, I remember looking out through one of the small windows next to the door. I saw it turn and scramble up the side of the apartment building, like it was both crawling and climbing at the same time. It disappeared over the roof, and that was the last I saw of it. I know this sounds like something out of a horror movie, but I swear on everything that it's true. I don't know what that thing was, and part of me is glad I never found out. But another part of me can't help but be curious, you know? Anyway, that's my story. Maybe someone out there's seen something similar. Who knows what's lurking in the shadows, right? Thanks for letting me share this. It feels good to get it out there, even if I never got the answers I was looking for. I signed up to work for a freelance security firm to earn some extra cash before the holidays, and I'd worked dozens of jobs without any issues until this happened. I got a call early in the day from my recruiter telling me they needed emergency help because this hotel's usual guy quit his position, effective immediately. They sent me the address and I went in. The front desk worker showed me what I was supposed to do during the night. I had a station in the lobby across from them. I was supposed to act more like a deterrent for crime than anything. And I had to do a round through the hotel every two hours to make sure everything was all right. Seemed easy enough. Not long after I settled in the desk, attendants started making small talk. I'm not much of a talker, so I answered in short responses to try and signal like, hey, let's just enjoy the quiet. Some time passed, and out of the blue they said to me, this place is haunted, you know. Of course, I had to ask more about that, but when I did, all they said was, I'm sure you'll see it for yourself soon enough, then laughed as if it were a normal thing to say. I left to do my first round. I brushed off what they'd said. I've always been skeptical, and some crazy old receptionist wouldn't change that so quickly. The hotel was only three stories, with ten rooms available for guests to stay in. I walked up the first flight of stairs and cleared the second floor. Then I walked up the second set of stairs and began walking down the hall. I couldn't explain it, but something in me was on edge as soon as I stepped foot in the hall. A chill came over me and I felt the hair on my neck stand up. It was quiet as I walked to the end of the hall. I made it halfway back down the hallway, then I heard thumping from above me. It was loud and it sounded like it was coming towards me, like heavy footsteps running almost. I stood in place and looked at the ceiling while I heard the noise. The sound finally reached where I was standing, and just as I was expecting it to move further away, it thumped three times right on top of me. As soon as the thumping stopped, I heard a slow creaking noise from behind me. I turned around and the door to one of the rooms I'd walked past had opened. I didn't want to go in. I wanted to turn around and leave. 
but it was my job for the night and I had to check it out. I walked to the door and knocked on it before I opened it all the way. I yelled, hello, to see if anyone responded. I was hoping a guest might have heard the thumping and peeked out to see what it was. No response. I opened the door all the way and turned on the light. There was no one in the room, and it didn't even look like a room they would have guests in. All of the furniture was covered with white sheets, and the pictures and mirrors were off the wall and facing away from view. I couldn't understand how the door opened. I tried to rationalize it. Maybe the vibrations from the thumping opened it, or I stepped on a loose floorboard. But it didn't make sense. I closed the door and left. I made my way back down to the lobby and the receptionist was still there, looking at me with a small grin. They asked me if everything was all right on the walk through. I asked her how many people were staying on the third floor, and they told me that only one couple was staying at the hotel, and they were on the second floor. I was clearly confused by that information, and they asked me what happened. I told them. We chatted about some other strange occurrences that had happened at the hotel until my next round. Apparently, people have reported seeing shadowy figures. They've heard knocks at their doors, and no one was there when they answered. And many people have said they've had vivid nightmares. I was apprehensive about my next walkthrough, but I had to do it. The second floor was fine, no disturbances to report. But the third floor was once again noisy. It wasn't thumping this time. I could have sworn I heard crying. I froze when I looked down the hall. The same door was open, and I know I closed it. I approached the room slowly with my hand on my taser and turned on the light. The crying stopped when the light came on. I walked in and looked around the room. I didn't see anyone. I called out for whoever was in there to come out, but I got no response. I walked to the window to make sure it was shut and locked, but as my back was turned, I heard the door slam. I immediately dropped what I was doing to rush to the door. I opened it and walked out of the room. At the end of the hall, I saw her. A woman stood in front of the stairs with her face in her hands like she was crying. My heart fell to my feet and I froze in place. Thumping noises began above me again and rapidly made their way towards the woman. The door to another room creaked open and she walked inside. I ran down the stairs back to the lobby without looking back. I told the receptionist what I saw and they nodded their head. It wasn't a new story to them. I suppose this is why the other security guy quit on such short notice. I'm a geologist by profession, and my work frequently takes me to some pretty remote and isolated locations, places most people never get the chance to visit. Last week, I was up in the northern reaches of Alberta, Canada, conducting a survey for a potential mining site. The work itself is a bit mundane, you know, running seismic tests, collecting rock samples and such. But what I experienced during one of these expeditions, well, it's something I can't quite shake off. I was out late trying to finish my rounds before a forecasted storm rolled in. I began to notice something peculiar, though. There was this odd clicking noise, faint at first, but becoming more distinct as time went on. It was unlike any sound I've come across in my years of field work. Then, a few hours into the night, I saw it. At first, I could just make out a pale, gaunt figure moving quickly on all fours in the distance. My headlamp only caught glimpses, but there was something chillingly human-like about its appearance. As it got closer, I could see the size of it more clearly. It stood roughly five feet high when upright, but it seemed to prefer moving on all fours. Its speed was incredible. One moment it was there in the beam of my light, the next it was gone, only to reappear somewhere else entirely. I was taken aback by its face. It had large, pitch-black eyes, much bigger than any human's eyes, and an open, gaping mouth, but no discernible nose. The clicking noises I heard earlier, they were coming from this thing. Seeing that creature, it was like a punch to the gut, you know. The fear, the adrenaline, everything was so intense. My mind was racing, trying to make sense of it all, but it's like every natural instinct in me was screaming danger. 
The creature didn't seem to notice me at first, or at least it didn't show any signs of aggression. I was trying to stay as quiet as possible, hoping that it would just move on. The smell around me became heavy, almost metallic, like the scent of iron or fresh blood. That's when I realized the creature was moving in a pattern, like it was searching for something. Suddenly, it turned its head directly towards me. It's hard to describe the terror I felt. It wasn't just a physical presence, but a crushing wave of dread that overwhelmed me. My heart pounded in my chest as the creature moved closer, the clicking noise getting louder and more rapid. The standoff didn't last long, though. It was only a matter of seconds, but it felt like an eternity. Then out of nowhere, a loud crack of thunder rolled in, followed by the first drops of rain. The creature immediately recoiled and retreated, moving at an incredible speed until it was nothing more than a distant figure in the darkness. After that, I quickly packed up my gear and headed back to camp. I didn't sleep that night. I couldn't. Every sound, every rustle in the bushes kept me on high alert. I was out of there at the first light of dawn, and I've not been back since. I still don't know what it was I encountered that night, but it was something I'm not eager to cross paths with again. I'd love to hear what you and your listeners think about this. I work at this summer home community in the Blue Ridge Mountains of North Carolina. Best I can describe it is that it's like a nice neighborhood that's kind of like a resort with a swimming pool, golf, hiking trails, spa, and clubhouse. It's the opposite of a snowbird community because it's completely inaccessible in the winter due to the snow in the mountains. I work there during the summer when all the residents are around, but I'm the only one who also stays through the winter, basically making sure the place isn't ransacked when no one else is there. I live in a small house, and I don't do much except wander around in my pickup with the snowplow attachment, just making my presence known. I bring up supplies for the whole winter and just stay from October until early April or so, alone. It's not as bad as it sounds since the satellite, TV, and internet work pretty well. I can communicate with the outside world, I just can't really get any goods I need during those months, so I have to plan in advance. I have a big chest freezer, but I also eat a lot of canned food. I do what I can, but the food does get a bit boring. My first winter up there was really quiet. Nothing much happened. I watched a lot of TV and ate a lot of chili and chips. This past winter, though, something odd happened. I usually try to walk around the neighborhood at least once a day, not just because of my job, but also just to get out. I would go nuts in the house all day. Unless it's a snowstorm, of course. One of the first days I was there, I went out. It hadn't snowed yet since it was just October, but everyone was gone since you really never know when snow might come. They go ahead and close the community just in case. I still had a few winterizing things to do, like check on the pool's foundation. I headed down to the pool to do that, walking just for the exercise. I started looking around the pool when I heard this strange noise coming from the nearby woods. The community itself is all groomed and landscaped, but the woods really isn't that far away. It is the mountains after all. So a few yards behind the grassy area next to the pool was forest, basically. The noise was like nothing I'd ever heard. Something between a yell and a yodel. Not really scary, but strange. I just watched the woods to see if I could get a look at whatever it was, but I didn't see anything, just heard that odd sound. A few weeks later, the first snow came. I stayed inside because I couldn't afford to get lost, being on my own and everything. The next day it was sunny, and I decided to first head out and plow the roads around the neighborhood. I'd learned by trial and error that if I let the plowing go too long, it'd be almost impossible to do it when it snowed again. Snow gets deep and packed in then which wouldn't be a big deal since no one else was up there, but I couldn't really do my job if I couldn't go around checking on everything. I started up the truck in late morning and started driving around, plowing the few roads that snake around the hundred or so homes in the community. While I was plowing, I saw some tracks in the snow off the road. I'd seen tracks from coyotes, deer, and even bear, but these tracks were bigger. 
I couldn't see what they were, though, and I didn't bother to get out of the truck to get a look. I didn't think much more about the tracks until one evening when I was walking on the newly plowed road. It was just beginning to get dark, and I thought I should head back. As I turned around, I glanced toward the woods and saw something walking just outside the trees. At first, I thought it was a person and I was scared. There wasn't supposed to be anyone out here. There wasn't any reason for anyone to be here, and if they were here, they had to have hiked or come in by helicopter. You can't use those mountain roads in winter, which is exactly why we closed the neighborhood. As I stared at it, though, I could see it was too big and hairy to be a person. It was covered with hair or fur or something. But it wasn't an ape because it walked upright. Also, it was pretty far away, but I thought it was taller than a person, maybe eight or nine feet. I remembered the tracks then and wished I'd taken a picture of them. I was scared, but then I started to think that it must have been around for a while and it hadn't hurt me, so why would it now? A few days later, I saw some tracks outside my house. This time, I did take a look at them and saw they looked like bare human feet. Only really big, like size 25 shoes maybe, I don't know. Right on my doorstep was a dead fish. At first I was scared. Did this thing come right up to my house and leave me a dead fish? But then I started to think maybe it was a gift, because it was fresh. And that creature must have gone to some trouble to get it since the lakes and streams were iced over. I took it inside and cooked it and it was the best thing I'd eaten since fall. A few days later it brought me a rabbit. That was a little gross, but what the heck, I found a video online on how to clean it and ate that too. It kept bringing me things all winter. Not every day, but every few days. And weirdly, I felt less alone. Once spring came, I didn't see any evidence of it anymore. It felt kind of lonely, thinking it was gone. But I bet it'll be back this winter. My old house used to sit in a nice rural area in Ohio. It was a really nice, tranquil area surrounded by trees, nature, and wildlife. It was about a hundred miles away from Loveland, if you know where that is. It was definitely a small town vibe. Everybody knew each other's name and secrets were hard to keep. There was a local reservoir that I would frequently catch catfish in. It was a really cool place, and since there wasn't much else for a young boy to do in my town, I pretty much spent every single day fishing at the reservoir. Life was simple back then, but things changed when I saw something I would never forget in that reservoir. I was spending the evening with my friends, Kyle and Lenny, exploring the nooks and corners of our hometown. Eventually, of course, we all decided to head to the reservoir. We'd made our way to the swampy shores hoping to catch a catfish or two, but what we found was not a catfish. It was something different. As we edged closer to the water, a creepy figure emerged from the dark, rippling surface. It was taller than any of us, reaching almost seven feet. It had an unusual humanoid appearance, but with no arms in sight. A sight so surreal it seemed like it was pulled from a science fiction movie. In our shock, we tried to make sense of what we saw. Green, glowing eyes gleamed ominously in the murky darkness, and its feet, webbed and large, made a squishing sound as it tread on the swampy ground. Was it an escaped experiment? A cruel joke someone was playing on us? Or was it something we couldn't explain at all? Frozen in fear, we could only stare as the creature moved toward us. Lenny, the bravest amongst us, stood his ground, not taking his eyes off the luminescent green orbs that stared right back at us. The creature stopped momentarily, as if studying us, before moving again. This time its direction was clear. It was moving towards Lenny. Lenny, move, I remember yelling, but it was as if he was under some sort of trance. He just stood there, captivated by the creature's glowing eyes. Before any of us could react, the creature was inches away from Lenny. The eerie silence was broken by a soft, squelching sound as the creature extended what could have been its mouth. In a moment of sheer panic, Kyle and I lunged forward, grabbing Lenny by his arms and pulling him away. We didn't stick around to see what the creature did next. Adrenaline pumping, we ran as fast as we could, leaving behind the chilling, squelching sounds and the glow of green eyes. That night, none of us could sleep. We were haunted by what we'd seen, by the creature that had almost gotten Lenny. 
it was clear to us that what we encountered was no ordinary creature. The next day, we returned to the reservoir reluctantly. We wanted answers. We found large, webbed footprints exactly where we'd seen the creature emerge from the water, a chilling reminder of our encounter. We quickly decided to report this to the local police. I'll never forget the skeptical look on the sheriff's face as we narrated our experience. He humored us, visiting the reservoir to investigate. But his skepticism faded when he saw the footprints. Even he couldn't dismiss the tangible evidence right in front of him. Though we continued to fish at the reservoir, things were never the same. Every ripple in the water would send shivers down our spines. We'd laugh it off, joking about the lake monster, but the humor was tinged with a sense of underlying fear. As for Lenny, he's never been quite the same. He's quieter, more reserved. He was no longer the bravest amongst us, and there was a wariness in his eyes, a caution that wasn't there before. We never talk about that night. It became a silent pact between us. But the memory remains etched into our minds, a chilling reminder of the day the Charles Mill Lake monster almost got Lenny. Life has a strange way of unfolding. I left my small town and my friends behind, seeking a fresh start in the big city. I exchanged the reservoir's gentle lapping waves for honking taxis and towering skyscrapers. I left believing I was escaping the ghost of that horrid monster, but it was a memory that trailed me like a shadow. Years turned into decades, and our terrifying encounter at the reservoir became a distant memory. I lost touch with Kyle and Lenny, our paths diverging in the complicated maze of life. But I often found myself wondering how they were, if they too were haunted by those luminescent green eyes. One cold winter night, I found myself back at the reservoir. It was not a planned visit, but a spontaneous drive that led me there. Everything was just as I remembered the cool breeze, the eerie silence, and the dark water surface. As I stood on the edge of the reservoir, staring into its dark depths, I realized that the encounter with the monster had left a deeper mark on me than I initially thought. It wasn't just a memory of fear. It was a lesson, a harsh one, that humbled me and shaped me into the person I had become. The universe is vast and filled with mysteries we cannot comprehend. Our understanding of the world is like a grain of sand in a vast desert. My encounter with the creature was a reminder of our insignificance and the infinite mysteries that our universe holds. I've learned to respect these mysteries and live with the realization that we do not control the world. Instead, we are merely temporary inhabitants. There's so much more out there than our minds can fathom. And now, as I live my life in the bustling city, far from the quiet tranquility of my hometown, I carry this lesson with me. Every honk of a taxi, every rush of the crowd, is a reminder of the vast, mysterious world beyond our understanding. Even today, the thought of that strange, horrid creature sends chills down my spine. But it's a chilling reminder that I'm grateful for. It's made me realize that we're a part of a world much larger than ourselves, a world filled with unimaginable wonders and terrifying creatures, a world that, in its unfathomable depth, holds more mysteries than we could possibly imagine. That monster is a part of that mystery, a part of my story, a part of who I am. This happened over 20 years ago in Delaware County, Pennsylvania. It was a pretty long time ago, so I might be a little fuzzy on some of the details. When I was around 10 or 11 years old, I didn't really have all that many friends, so I would spend a lot of time at my cousin's house, who was a few years older than me. Despite the age gap, my cousin and I were close, and his mom treated me like another son. Plus, he had video games and a flat-screen TV in his basement. I would sleep over a lot. Sometimes in the summer, I would spend the whole weekend... Usually, it was just me and him doing dumb stuff or playing video games, but sometimes his friends from around the neighborhood would come hang out and we would all crash in the basement. I kind of idolized these kids. They were all older than me, but still treated me like I was one of their friends. They would joke around all the time and come up with crazy things to do. Nothing dangerous, but stuff like egging houses or prank calls. I loved hanging out with them. This one time when a bunch of his friends came over, they all planned to spend the night. 
I'm not sure how it even came up, but we all decided to pull an all-nighter. Somehow it seemed like a great idea. So that's what we did. We ordered pizza at 10 p.m. and took turns playing Mario Kart for hours, until like 2 a.m. Two of the kids eventually fell asleep, and naturally we drew all over their faces, and dipped their hands in cups of water to see if they would pee themselves. Typical early 2000s teenage stuff. I was exhausted, but after seeing all that happening, I recommitted myself to staying up all night. And I did. Around 5 a.m., everybody was awake at this point. The other two kids woke up after the vandalism. We all decided to take blankets out onto the front yard and hang out. It was summer, so it was warm, and my cousin lived in a nicer neighborhood. The thought of something potentially bad happening never even crossed our minds. So, there we all were, hanging out on the front yard with our blankets, laying in the grass and just shooting the breeze. After a little while, the sun was just starting to peek out, and the guys were dropping off to sleep one by one. It was just me and my cousin talking for a little while, but eventually he surrendered to sleep too. Not only did I make it, but I was now the last one. I was exhausted at this point, but for some reason just couldn't fall asleep. I was staring up at the rising sun when I saw something moving out of the corner of my eye. I turned my head to face it and was very confused about what I saw. It looked like a short little fuzzy bear walking on two legs. It had this weird kind of thick looking white fur. I didn't see any eyes, so I couldn't tell if it was looking at me. It just stood in the middle of the road, I guess facing my direction. I figured I was like hallucinating or something, so I rubbed my eyes, but when I opened them, it was still there. I didn't know what it was and really didn't think anything that small could be dangerous. So I uncovered myself, stood up, and took a few steps towards it. As soon as I started walking its way, it did a sort of shuffle away from me. No turning its body around or anything, it just moved. I stopped and it stopped. I started walking towards it again and it shuffled away so I just kept on walking after it. It was a summer Saturday morning, so nobody was out and about. No cars or pedestrians on the road, just me and this little fur ball. It just kept walking up the road and I just kept on following. After a few minutes, the thing cut off the road and into a thick patch of trees and kept going. I stood on the road and watched its weird little body move into the woods, walk about 100 feet in and just stop in some kind of little clearing. Too curious at this point, I followed in without hesitation. I walked maybe halfway towards the clearing when I stopped. I just remember feeling afraid, like really scared. I didn't know what, but it felt like I was doing something wrong or that I shouldn't be here. The thing just kept staring at me. I also noticed a kind of awful smell. It reminded me of the time when our refrigerator shorted out while we were away on vacation and we came home to the smell of rancid meat throughout the house. I backed up a few paces, and when I did that, the thing shuffled towards me. I turned my back on it and started walking a little faster. I looked over my shoulder and it wasn't doing a shuffling anymore. It was running full speed towards me. I bolted right out of there. When I got back to the road, I kept running. I looked over my shoulder and the thing was just gone. Vanished. I ran a few hundred yards back to Cousin's house and I shook him awake and told him I wanted to go inside. Thankfully, he didn't ask any questions. He probably just figured I was tired and wanted to sleep on the couch. We woke the rest of the guys up and went into the basement. It took a while, but eventually I was able to fall back asleep until my dad came to get me later that afternoon. I never told anyone this story until now, and despite going to my cousin's house a bunch more times, I never saw the thing again, though I always stayed away from that little patch of woods. I forgot all about this incident over the years and only just remembered when I found your channel. I had eventually just chalked it up to being overtired, but after seeing so many other stories like mine, I don't really know. My strange encounter happened about a year ago. I know this story is not one of your typical encounters, but it happened. I have seriously been shaken ever since. I work at a national park in Kentucky. It is called Mammoth Cave. Mammoth Cave is a massive cave system currently known as the most extensive cave system in the world. It has over 420 miles of explored tunnels. It is still expanding. The portion outside of the cave is a large park as well. 
It is a great place to take a family on vacation. Families can hike, kayak, and explore the cave. However, as I say this, I also preface with being cautious of your time inside the cave. I have worked at many parks throughout my career. I have a niche in war history, specifically weaponry. Mammoth Cave was an exciting placement for me. The bats that live in the cave produce guano, bat poop, a key component in potassium nitrate, better known as saltpeter, used during earlier wars. Enslaved people were forced to mine it. Several artifacts from that period have been recovered from the cave. I am not one to typically believe in wild tales, but after my encounter, I discovered your channel hoping to make sense of what I saw. Honestly, though, it has led me to believe that many things in our big world are unexplainable. Anyhow, I digress. Part of working the caves means giving tours. Tours become monotonous quickly. Tourists are always asking the same questions and giving out the same answers over and over. Rinse and repeat. I always try to be engaging to elicit good tips. It was a Tuesday in the second tour I had given that morning. I had a relatively large group of people. Part of the group was a family of three, mom, dad, and a girl about the age of 10. The family was relatively quiet but seemed engaged throughout the tour. Of course, the cave comes with its legends. Some of these are spirits that haunt the cave, but I never gave this much thought. I never even considered that there was such a thing as a ghost. I always felt that ghosts were a bunch of hoopla created by simple-minded people. I would, of course, tell the stories in the hope of engaging my audience, but I had never seen anything to make me believe that there was any truth to it. As I led my group to the haunted chamber, I noticed the temperature had changed. The temperature change seemed odd because the cave keeps a consistent 54 degrees once inside and away from the entrance. Over my time working within the cave system, I had become accustomed to the temperature. I remember thinking that perhaps I was getting sick. As I began speaking to the group, the internal light system glitched. The lights were not going off, but they were dimming. The lights dimming was unusual. During this, I glanced at the family standing before me to the right. The daughter suddenly pitched forward like someone had shoved her from behind. Her dad's quick reflexes saved her from a fall. I asked if she was okay and she said someone had pushed her. The strange thing was her family was to the side and no one was behind them. I checked that she was okay and had my partner continue with the group while I attended to this family. As I leaned down in front of the girl, rocks started shuffling behind her. Small stones about the size of driveway gravel began rolling. The ground was unlevel in this chamber section, but not enough for the previously undisturbed stones to move. I told the family we should catch up with the group and leave now. As we exited the chamber, I saw someone's back as they rounded a rock outcropping. Thinking that this was another tour member trying to be funny, by being disruptive within a historic site, I quickly returned to the area to confront the hoodlum. Guess what, Mark? Nothing. No one was there. The entire room was empty except for me. There was nowhere someone could have hidden or gone to escape. I am nervous, anxious, and a little sick at this point. I quickly caught up to the group, and luckily we were at the end of the tour. I took the rest of the day off and debated returning to work the next day. I am unsure if it was the girl, the time we were there, or me. I have no idea, but there is truly something supernatural inside Mammoth Cave.